Alexander the Great, the shining light of ancient Greece. The prince from remote Macedonia would become the greatest conqueror of all time. No one would have thought that someone would try to conquer the whole world and that he would almost succeed. He was the first European to establish an empire that stretched from the Mediterranean to the end of the known world. Fame on the battlefield was dearer to him than his own life. He turned his war into a holy mission. He entered the stage as a liberator, and he dreamed of an empire where the peoples lived together in peace, with him being at the top. Only very few people had as much influence on history as Alexander the Great. Alexander's story starts with a legend. It is said that the gods announced his birth with natural phenomena. It must have been the night of July 20th, 356 BC, when Olympias went into labor. The royal family was hoping for a son. They needed an heir to the throne. Alexander was only the second born, but it was clear from the start that Olympia's son was destined to lead Macedonia into a bright future. Alexander, live up to your purpose. In the fourth century BC, Greece was undergoing radical change. While some still believed in myth and divine providence, Others were already seeking scientific reasoning. The big cities facilitated these new trends. Above all, Athens, which had established democracy. There, the citizens determined the politics. Alexander's home was far away from the modern centers, north of Mount Olympus, in a rural area. Macedonia had long been a simple peasant state, a kingdom that had long been economically irrelevant and politically in dire straits. Only Alexander's father, King Philip II, showed what he and his country were capable of. He reorganized his forces, developed new weapons, and turned the cavalry into his strongest attack formation. He extended his sphere of power in several battles, and he forged alliances. However, the four biggest cities turned against the victorious leader. They claimed that Macedonia was barbarian, although the kingdom did everything to modernize itself according to Greek standards. Philip promoted progress especially in the Macedonian capital, Pella. The king turned the humble settlement into a stately seat of government. This was where Alexander grew up, in a time of great upheaval. The heir to the throne enjoyed an elite education. On a daily basis, he practiced close combat and the handling of weapons. His education prepared him for a tough reality. Whoever wanted to rule had to be able to fight. His father, Philip, lived by it. He was mostly at war, while Olympias took care of their son's upbringing. Come on, Alexander! Earn your companion's respect! Even defend yourself. Come here. 
Leave me alone! What's going on, son? I'm sorry, father. I... I have... Never show your weakness. You have to be the best, always. Stop it. He's still a child. That's not your business. Macedonia needs warriors. And what do I get? My first son is a moron, and the second one a loser. You ridicule me. Alexander, show him what you have learned. I've seen enough for today. To understand the relationship between Philip and Alexander, it is important to take into account that although Philip was married to seven women, he only had two sons from these marriages. And his second son, Philip Aradaius, didn't live up to his expectations. He might have had a physical impairment, sometimes he's even characterized as moronic. Hence, Alexander was the only son that Philip could present to the world. Alexander not only had to live up to his father, but also to his divine descent. A mosaic from Pella shows him with a lion. He looks like Heracles, a son of Zeus. The lion symbolizes Alexander's royal descent, and Heracles symbolizes his godlike status. He was born into it. Alexander's parents also believed in their divine descent. This form of fictional pedigree wasn't uncommon in ancient times. Many royal families justified their claim to power with it. The belief in gods was taken seriously in Macedonia. No one doubted that the heir to the throne, Alexander, had inherent superhuman skills. But it was Olympia's religious beliefs that influenced Alexander. She engaged in religious rituals and kept telling the boy that he wasn't of this world. Come to me, my darling. Don't listen to your father. His heart is made of stone. I do as he wishes. Why is he always disappointed in me? Come on. No. He's not disappointed. He's jealous. Because your blood is more royal than his. Mother, please, you don't really believe that. I'll tell you a secret. The night you were conceived, I heard thunder. And I felt that lightning struck my body. But you're unharmed. Don't you understand? Zeus made you. Zeus is your father. Philip knows it and is jealous. That Zeus was Alexander's father is another spectacular story. These stories are usually told when it comes to the circumstances of conception of famous people from ancient times. Their mothers suddenly have spectacular dreams. Gods appear in the form of animals and father these children in a dream or in reality, who then have an inherent heroic aura. The heroes of Greek mythology were Alexander's role models. Like them, he wanted to be the best and exceed them all. His biggest hero was Achilles from the myth about the Battle of Troy. Achilles is the main figure. He is invulnerable and the bravest warrior. 
Patroclus, his loyal friend, fights by his side. Both die in combat, but their deeds make them immortal. Aristotle, one of Greece's biggest thinkers, has a transcript of the story made for Alexander. The king's son was only 13 when Aristotle agreed to educate the prince in Pella. He taught Alexander everything about Greek culture, drama, geography, sciences, as well as literature and philosophy. But most importantly, he studied Homer's Iliad. The story was compulsory reading. Every Greek knew it. Can you remember what Achilles' father told his son? He should always be the best and outdo everyone. My father could have said this. Your father might be wiser than many think. Did Achilles manage? Achilles' ambition is unlike normal people's ambition. He was driven by holy wrath. Because he took revenge for Patroclus and had his murderer dragged through the mud for days? That's right. But he also showed benevolence in having him buried in dignity. Achilles had a choice between a long life that would sink into oblivion or a short life and eternal glory. I will never achieve that. Why not? My father won't leave anything to me. Before I can prove myself, he'll have conquered all of Greece. Come here, I'll show you something. Come on. Let him have Greece. You've got the whole world left. From the Persian Empire all the way to India. Hundred years ago, their king attacked Greece. He destroyed our cities and burned the Acropolis of Athens. What happened then? The Greeks united and drove the Persians out. What is left for me then? The Persians are still a constant threat. Their soldiers are stationed across the Hellespont. They are right at our doorstep. Even Achilles' grave is in the hands of these barbarians. Do you want eternal glory? Unite the Greeks and lead them against the Persians. That would indeed be a heroic act. Aristotle was a polymath who knew his way around all topics. He was the son of a doctor. He taught Alexander medicine, science, and, of course, Homer. Alexander was hungry for knowledge. His education was important in his later life as an explorer and admirer of Homer. There is this famous quote of his, Philip gave me my life, but Aristotle gave me the good life. Aristotle's school was located in a remote nymph sanctuary, an ideal place to devote oneself to the search for wisdom and insight. Nature's got many secrets, but you will not be able to unlock them purely by thinking. You have to observe the world. You have to feel it, taste it, smell it, and discover it with your senses. Come on, try it. Huh. Observe it and understand it. Look, there's a feather. There's the nest. Hey, let's fetch an egg. We'll never get one. The bird will attack us. You scare him away. And I'll get the egg. That's far too dangerous. Achilles and Patroclus weren't afraid. Come on. Alexander's courage was proverbial. 
He took on every challenge. <laughs> and he had Hephaestion, his friend. He was always by his side. between courage and foolishness. Every venture has to be considered. Only then will it be rewarded. Remember that. The egg proves that I wasn't foolish, but courageous. Your words are wiser than your actions, Alexander. But if you just follow your passion, you act without sense. That's the end of the lesson. After three years, Alexander was ready for being a sovereign. Most of his preparation came from Aristotle. They didn't always agree, but the scholar remained one of his closest advisors. The best known legend from Alexander's childhood is the taming of Bucephalus. What's your father doing here? He's looking for horses for the royal guards. I can't wait for us to fight by the king's side. Maybe, but I don't think my father wants to have me by his side. What have you got today? A horse befitting only a king. This is Bucephalus, my best horse. But Bucephalus means ox head. Some think it's because of his branding. Others think it's because he is stubborn, like an ox. <laughs> A proud horse. What does it cost? Thirteen talents. That's a high price. Let me have a look at him. According to the sources, many tried, but nobody could ride the stallion. Only Alexander understood why the horse was in a panic. I know why Bucephalus is nervous. Why? Wait! I've got enough wild mares. I don't need a stubborn stallion. Father! I can ride him. Don't be too sure. If a grown man can't do it, why should you? Let me try it. Please. If I can't tame him, I'll pay you back. Okay, I'm offering six talents. I don't want my son to be heavily indebted so young. Don't be afraid. You're afraid of your own shadow, right? Turn around. Calm down. Look at him. That's my son. <laughs> Look for a suitable kingdom, my son. Macedonia's too small for you. With this story, Alexander's conquests became providential, and his horse became the most famous animal of ancient times. The connection between the stallion and the prince was unique. No one but him was ever able to ride Bucephalus, they say. These stories are an attempt to explain something very special. They are told so that we can understand a special historical event or an outstanding historical figure. There is this young boy who seems to be a horse whisperer. He tames the horse using psychology so that the horse obeys on its own accord. This story essentially describes Alexander the Great's captivating charisma. 
However, Alexander's childhood ended abruptly when he was 16. The crown prince had to face a big task. King Philip's aggressive expansionism resulted in a new conflict. Bloody clashes were imminent. Philip went to war. In his absence, Alexander was supposed to rule the empire. I entrust my empire to your care. From now on, you are my co-regent. An attack at the Dardanelles caused the crisis. Philip captured a shipload of grain that was meant to go to Athens. The powerful state was furious and remembered an outrage from the distant past. When the Persians burned the temple of the city 150 years earlier, the Macedonians were allies of the Persians. The reconstruction of the temple was a symbol of Athens' triumph over the Persians. Eventually, they managed to fight off the enemy. At peak times, 80,000 people lived at the foot of the entrenched upper city. Athens has had a long history of democracy. The citizens decided on important matters. Sovereigns like those in Macedonia or Persia had long been abolished. Demosthenes was Philip's main adversary. With a passionate speech, the politician encouraged the council to put Macedonia into its place by military means. Not with words, but with deeds, our predecessors turned us into free Greeks with their blood. They saved us from Persian tyranny. But now, Athens' freedom is threatened again by Philip, king of Macedonia. But it was the Persians who destroyed our city back then, not the Macedonians. We should regard them as friends, not as a threat. We should form an alliance with them to destroy the Persians. The Macedonians are not Greeks, but barbarians. Like the Persians, they are full of malice. An alliance with them means having the enemy in our own home. The situation escalated into a war about Delphi. The temple wasn't only the Greeks' most sacred place, it played an important political role too. Those who reigned Delphi held the power in the heartland. Athens guarded the sacred place, but other Greek cities also wanted to control Delphi. The Macedonians saved the sacred temple from the invasion. Athens felt humiliated when the barbarians were made custodians of Delphi. In all of Greece, they looked for allies who would fight against the hated King Philip. The battle took place near Charonea. This time, Alexander and his companions were also present. For most of them, it was their first big battle in the royal army. Only the best men fought alongside the Macedonian prince. Clytus, for instance, who was said to be experienced. Parmenion, an old general. He had a son, Philotus. He and Ptolemy were Alexander's childhood friends, just like his closest confidant, Hephaestion. The Macedonians knew that the victors of the Battle of Charonea in 338 BC would decide the future of the Aegean world. With 34,000 soldiers each, both armies were equally strong. Alexander led the cavalry. It was to be decisive. It was about glory and honor, life and death, all or nothing. 
Didn't you say your father wouldn't leave any glory to us? I was mistaken. Get ready! At my command! Alexander and his men faced a fierce challenge. The cavalry was supposed to lead the attack. Just like Achilles and Patroclus. Under Alexander's command, the cavalry defeated the thieves, the dreaded elite troop. The Athenian foot soldiers were lured into a trap. They ran into a wall of deadly spears. The battle was won. Macedonia was the new military superpower in Greece. And Alexander was the hero of Charonea. Being the commander of the cavalry, it was Alexander who made victory possible. It strengthened his standing with the Macedonians and, to a degree, also with the Greeks. It made him credible as a future king. After the battle, Philip summoned all the city's delegates to Corinth. Sparta refused. But they still formed an alliance that forbade the Greeks to fight each other. Macedonia suggested attacking Persia together. Philip visited the Oracle of Delphi on his way back. The Sovereign wants to know his chances against this mighty opponent. The royal inquiry to the god Apollo cost him a golden laurel wreath. The oracle spoke through a priestess. The Pythia went into a trance in order to enter the world and wisdom of the gods. That's what the ancient Greeks believed. Poor people would only get a short answer, yes or no. Rich men like Philip got exclusive prophecies. She says the bull is limited. He will come to an end for the one who makes a sacrifice. She talks about a sacrificial bull. A sign of the king's death. But which king is she referring to? The Persian king? Or Philip? As always, Pythia's prophecies were cryptic. The priests decided upon their interpretation. They held the true power in Delphi. You wanted to know whether you'd defeat the Persians. The oracle said, the king will die. Philip is in no doubt. The signs point to a victory. What's the matter? We'll fight the Persians. No, not us. Father has decided. Parmenian will go as an advance guard. Without what? Without us? Has he forgotten who won the Battle of Charonea? I think he fears that I'm better than him. You should worry less about Philip. And more about his new wife. He's always had many women. Why would this one be... different? Don't be stupid. Your father will let you down. Mother, please. His new bride is dearer to him than I could ever be. Not because of her beauty, but because she is a true Macedonian. If she gives the king a son, he will ascend the throne. Oppose! 
Let us drink to the royal couple. Their health. May they provide us with a crown prince of pure Macedonian blood. See? What do you mean, huh? Alexander! He is drunk. Don't bother. I am the heir to the throne. Apologize, Alexander. Mathalos is my guest. I apologize. If you pay me the necessary respect, I'm still the king. I'm still the king. And it's still me who decides. And you have to obey me. Obey. Obey you? Look at you. You want to fight the Persians? You can't even walk straight, you fools. Together, you united Greece in battle. And now you argue amongst yourselves. Come on. We're not welcome anymore. Just leave. I don't want to ever see you again. Alexander and his mother went into exile to Epirus, Olympia's home. Endless months passed without any contact between father and son. Alexander was shunned. But as he was needed for the war against Persia, the Macedonian court eventually sent for him. You called for me, mother? Alexander. My old friend. <laughs> <laughs> Demaratus was sent by your father, who wants to reconcile with you. Did he say so? You know him. An apology is even harder for him than praise. But he regrets your dispute, and it is his most fervent wish that his son return to him. Hollow words. Hasn't Philip humiliated you enough? Instead of kneeling before him, you should take what is rightfully yours, with a sword in your hand. But he's my father. Zeus is your father. Please leave us alone. Mother. I've learned to tell courage from foolishness. The Macedonian nobility is on his side. Then earn their support. Look at you, my son. You are everything that Philip isn't. He is coarse, and you are noble. He is a warrior, but you... You are a king. Stop it. I won't fight my own father. He is not your father. It is not his blood that runs through your veins. We don't owe him anything. Olympias and Alexander have got common interests. Olympias can only influence the situation via her son. Her life could possibly depend on her son staying in power. Almost another year passed without further events. It was a wedding between the Macedonian royal dynasty and Olympia's family that marked a turning point. The dispute caused a stir in Pella. Upon Philip's invitation, Alexander finally returned. The men demonstrated their unity in the best interests of their kingdom. King Philip didn't suspect an assassin among his guests. Behold, father and son reunited. Father and son were reunited, but not everyone seemed to approve of the reconciliation. <laughs> 
father. The king was killed by his own bodyguard. Father! Someone help him! But it was too late for the sovereign. He died at the age of 46. King Philip is dead. Long live King Alexander. The way to the throne was open. Alexander took over without hesitation. Long live King Alexander. Long live King Alexander. Alexander and his mother were suspected of being instigators. Both had a motive, especially Olympias. She felt humiliated by Philip's new wife and she desperately wanted Alexander to be king. Philip's murder was never solved. If Olympias had given the impression of wanting to keep her place at court and support her son Alexander, then such accusations were bound to be made. The next logical step for such a woman was to be unfaithful, or to poison her husband, or instigate murder. Alexander buried his father in Virgina, according to Macedonian customs. The burial chamber is under a hill. Whether it really is King Philip's tomb is unclear to this day. The precious grave furnishings do suggest it. The crown, made of oak motifs, is made from pure gold. The larnax is also made of gold. The lid is decorated with the Virgina sun. The 16-rayed solar symbol is the emblem of Alexander's father, Philip. His legacy was a difficult one. For the new king of Macedonia, old opponents reappeared. Like his father, Alexander had to assert his sovereignty. If necessary, by force, Alexander began from zero. The Athenians used the change in power to question Macedonia's leading role. Again, Demosthenes was the spokesman. The gods have heard our prayers. They punished that tyrant Philip with his death. We have to act now. It's time to rebel against Alexander and take vengeance for Charonea. For the freedom of Athens, take up arms. The tribes in the north rebelled first followed by the big city-states, led by Athens and Thebes. No one wanted to miss out in the struggle for power, but the battle still had to be fought. Alexander quickly moved from the battlefields in the north to Thebes, but he tried to be diplomatic first. He promised to spare them if they surrendered. And? The Thebans won't give in. They'd rather fight for their freedom than surrender to a tyrant. <sighs> Some even believe you were killed in battle. Then a dead man will teach them fear. Alexander acted like a cold power politician. Without hesitation, he made an example of Thebes. His troops conquered the city and flattened it. More than 6,000 people died. Neither friend nor foe was to be left in any doubt. Alexander was determined to assert his leading role. 
the survivors of the massacre were all made slaves. The measures were approved by the League of Corinth. He justified it with the claim that Thebes broke the pact. The destruction of Thebes was a clear signal to all cities in Greece that opposed the supremacy of Macedonia. Embodied by the king of Macedonia, the commander of the League of Corinth. The citizens of Athens wrote to Alexander, king of Macedonia. The new hegemon of the League of Corinth. We praise you and congratulate you on the punishment of Thebes. We renew our oath to your father. We will stand by you as you are the defender of freedom always. Resistance was overcome and peace was secured. Now, it was time for Alexander to focus on foreign affairs. The coast beyond the Dardanelles, in today's Turkey, was his next destination in his campaign against Greece's archenemy. Alexander prepared for battle against the King of Kings, the sovereign of the Persian Empire. The most powerful empire in the world at the time reached across three continents and featured insurmountable mountain ranges. It touched the Indian borders. Even Babylon, the prettiest city of the East, was conquered by the Persians and made their second capital. Their army was 300,000 men strong and caused fear and terror everywhere. King Darius was a mighty, powerful enemy. Fighting a war against him would be a battle between David and Goliath. But the Macedonian didn't know fear. Alexander was determined to imitate Achilles. Just like the mythical hero, he wanted to take revenge and bring victory to Greece. In the spring of 334 BC, one of the biggest invasions in history began. Alexander risked everything. Alexander the Great, the shining light of ancient Greece. The prince from remote Macedonia would become the greatest conqueror of all times. No one would have thought that someone would try to conquer the whole world and that he would almost succeed. At the age of 16, his father made him co-regent these were troubled times. An assassination made him king, and his allies made Alexander the most powerful man in Greece. His campaign against King Darius of Persia resembled the battle between David and Goliath. But like Achilles, his hero from the legend, Alexander was determined to bring victory to the Greeks only very few people had as much influence on history as Alexander the Great. It was spring when Alexander passed the strait between Europe and today's Turkey. 
together with 37,000 soldiers from all over Greece. The Macedonian had a clear mission. He and his men were to free the Greek colonies from the Persians. First, Alexander went to Troy. At Achilles' grave, he had his weapons blessed, and he brought a sacrifice. Since childhood, the Iliad's hero had been Alexander's role model. He wanted to live up to Achilles' glory and even exceed his deeds. This war of liberation was his chance, but he also needed protection from the gods. With their blessing, his retaliation campaign became a holy war. But thus far, no one had managed to bring Persia, the world empire, to its knees. In their advance into occupied territory, the Persian army tried to stop them. To no avail. In 334 BC, Alexander won the battle at the river Granicus. Apparently, the Persian court had underestimated the Macedonian king. They hadn't sent their imperial army, but a troop of professional soldiers. King Darius had relied on them. A mistake, as it turned out. Your Majesty, I'm sorry for the bad news I have to bear. Alexander won the battle. How is that possible? Alexander has got fewer soldiers, but his tactics are clever, not only on the battlefield. Explain. He promises a democratic constitution modeled after Athens for those cities that surrender without a fight. And he promises everyone they don't have to pay you tribute. Is that true? Hmm. I heard that he rules like a king in Macedonia. The governance of the people is nonsense. What does he really want? The Greek want to take revenge for the destruction of Athens and the occupation of Anatolia. But Alexander wants more. What does he want? Power. He wants my throne. That's right. The defense of your country shouldn't be left to vassals. Who could lead our army better than you? He will regret that he ever left his mother's lap. Gather our troops and tell them their king will go to war. The Persian Empire reached from the Greek borders and Egypt all the way to the east, over the Hindu Kush to India, the end of the known world. The empire stretched across three continents, and at its heart was Persepolis, in the south of what is Iran today. Persepolis was also the religious center of Persia. Even 2,000 years later, the palaces and temples still convey the empire's power. Reliefs show the many nationalities of the giant empire, 28 peoples in total. Among them, Syrians, Egyptians, Babylonians, Greeks, Indians and Arabs, they all gathered to offer presents to the king on New Year's Day. The Persians were role models. They implemented a political order that allowed peaceful coexistence of the nations. But there was also resistance from the Greek colonies. Almost all of them saw Alexander as a liberator.
the Macedonian conquered the big coastal cities within a few months. And he had large parts of Turkey under his control when he chose Gordian to be his winter quarters. In the temple, he discovered Phrygian King Gordius's famous cart. And this is supposed to be a cart for a king. It belonged to Gordius, king of Phrygia. When the Phrygians looked for a king, the oracle told them to choose the first man they saw on a cart. <laughs> and by chance that was Gordius. Is that how quickly you can become king here? <laughs> yes, but that's not the whole story. Do you see this knot? What about it? It says, whoever can untie this knot will reign the Persian Empire. The knot doesn't seem to have a beginning or an end. The story of the Gordian knot is just a legend. And it was clever propaganda. To cut the knot with a sword, says, Alexander does things his own way. Everyone failed, and he showed them how to do it. But liberating the Greek colonies wasn't the end. Alexander wanted to knock Darius off his throne. Darius gathered his army in the borderland between Turkey and Syria. Alexander also moved his troops, but the two armies passed each other without noticing. Suddenly, the Persians were behind them and blocked the exit route. The land battle took place at Issus. The Macedonian king against Darius, the most powerful man in the world, and against more than 70,000 warriors. The enemy! stands between us and our home. We will triumph or die. Retreat is impossible. Don't be blinded by the glamour and size of our enemy. I see what you see, but none of you can see it with my eyes. The great king underestimates us. Be brave, because this it's not the first time we have faced superior numbers, and it will not be the last time. We will triumph! King Darius believed it would be an easy victory. He relied on the superior numbers of his army. The Macedonian leader was brave and relied on his cavalry. The Battle of Issus, 333 BC. The battle is depicted on the famous Alexander sarcophagus. The Macedonian king is the hero in this scene. The Persians, who were superior in numbers, dominated at first. But then Alexander managed to push through enemy lines. Darius's life was in danger as Alexander attacked the elite troops around the king. In the end, Darius could only flee. This sealed the Persian defeat. Alexander's success is partly due to the fact that he acted unexpectedly. It's almost like in football. The team that doesn't play with a predictable strategy scores more goals. And Alexander's strategy was very risky from a military point of view, seemingly heedless, he attacked the enemy at their strongest point. But the war wasn't won yet. Darius was still free, 
he escaped into the desert. The Macedonians rushed to the south. The inhabitants of Tyre went to war, but like everyone who rose against Alexander, they faced grave consequences. But most of Persia's allies celebrated Alexander as a liberator. The Egyptians greeted him with open arms. Their feud with the empire had lasted for too long. Like all Greeks, Alexander admired high culture. Rule over Pharaonic Egypt would be highly regarded back home. After taking power, he offered sacrifices to the gods and consulted the oracle. He got what he had hoped for. Alexander was made a godlike pharaoh. His portrait was even carved into stone as an acknowledgement that he was the rightful son of the highest god, Amun-Re. Shortly after, the new pharaoh set a sign. He founded Alexandria, modeled on Greek cities. It was a symbol of his passion for establishing his own culture in the conquered territories. All in all, Alexander founded at least 10 cities with his name. But the metropolis by the Mediterranean was the most important one. The fact that Alexander founded cities has special meaning because it shows that he didn't only want to conquer territories, but he wanted to establish lasting sovereignty. We can see that very clearly with the foundation of Alexandria, he had the vast resources in mind that Egypt and the Middle East offered economic resources. He planned a big seaport that would connect Egypt with the Mediterranean like a hub. In the spring of 331 BC, the Macedonians moved to the Euphrates in today's Iraq. Alexander couldn't be stopped in his advance. He didn't want to agree on a peace pact with the Persians. Alexander's army crossed the Euphrates. So, he didn't take my offer. How many soldiers does he have? We estimate about 40,000. 40,000? We are by far superior in numbers. We've got more than twice as many. In September, Alexander's troops crossed the Tigris as well. Darius awaited him at Galgamela. The Persian king had carefully chosen the battleground. There were wide plains on which his army could march. The Persian army exceeded anything Alexander had ever seen. They were over a hundred thousand men. Why didn't you make peace with Darius? What did he offer you? All territories west of Euphrates and 10,000 talents. No more than we had already taken ourselves. It's easy to offer something you don't own. I would have taken him up on his offer instead of risking everything now. If I'd been you, Parmenian, I might have done so. But there are no two suns in the sky. And there can't be two kings ruling Persia. And I thought we took revenge for their attacks on Greece. But it is not about that anymore. You want to surpass your late father. You want to surpass everyone. And even if? So far, we've only liberated territories the Persians had conquered. Now we are on their territory, and we will conquer them! Let's surprise them, and start the attack tonight. That would be cowardly. I don't want to steal the victory. 
I want to fight honorably. Eye for an eye at dawn. You've heard it. Set up camp. We will face a challenge. Darius's super army extended across five kilometers. A frontal attack would have been pointless. Alexander started a diversionary maneuver. At first, he moved parallel to the Persian front. Simultaneously, his infantry attacked the center. The Persians thought he would attack the wings, but he made them follow him until their front broke apart. Then he suddenly turned his cavalry around. He pressed into the gap in the center in order to attack the Persian king directly. He applied the strategy he used at Issus again. Tirelessly, he attacked the troops around the Persian king. Alexander wanted a final decision in a fight of man against man. Darius! Move! Darius abandoned his troop. They fought to the bitter end. Alexander! We need you at the left flank, or the Persians will storm our camp! I don't believe it, the old fool! Darius! Darius' escape sealed the Persians' second big defeat. It was the last chapter of his reign. Still on the battlefield, Alexander proclaimed himself the new king. His reputation as bearer of peace went before him. His victory at Gaugamela showed the Persian people that Persian military power wasn't reliable anymore. Alexander didn't have to conquer a big city. Babylon, Susa, Ekbatana, they all opened their gates. Come in, have our treasures. Alexander entered Babylon as a world ruler. His arrival turned into a triumphal procession. Babylon had been in Persian hands for 200 years. They had made the biggest and most beautiful oriental city their second seat of government. Unbelievable. Even Athens would pale in comparison to Babylon. Its size, splendor, and luxury were not of this world, claims the legend of Babylon's foundation. Not kings, but the gods themselves had built it. The Macedonians had only known this legendary city from stories told by Aristotle. He didn't hold it in high regard. But Alexander was impressed. He wanted to make it even more glamorous, and he wanted to reside in Babylon like his predecessor Darius. The king of ostracized Macedonia had made his dreams come true. He avenged Greece and achieved victory. He achieved sovereignty over the biggest empire in the world. Aristotle called the Babylonians barbarians? Probably because he never saw their city. If barbarians can perform such miracles? I'm happy to be their king. Soon after, Alexander moved via Susa to Persepolis. The Persian capital held the treasury that he desperately needed. The war chest was almost empty, and the soldiers had to be paid. 
Most of them thought Persepolis would be their last stop. The retaliation campaign was supposed to end here. <laughs> we took our revenge on the battlefield. Let's complete our work with a torch. Alexander! What are you doing? You are king of Persia now. Why would you want to burn your own palace down? Maybe he's right. What kind of men are you? We are not allowed to abuse their women? And now we are being denied a bonfire? Is that what your revenge looks like? Let it be. We have completed our mission. We should finally return to Greece. Never! Not before Darius kneels in front of me in the dust! All this is worth nothing as long as he is free! The feast ended in catastrophe. The palace burned down almost entirely. What the flames spared, the soldiers carried away. There has been much speculation over it. Until today, it's unclear whether Alexander only acted on impulse. There is one possible reason, often missed in literature. Alexander wanted to make Babylon the capital, not Persepolis. A second center bore the danger of growing opposition. He wanted to make Babylon the center, and that's why he destroyed Persepolis. A little later, the day came. He sent home large parts of his troop. First of all, the soldiers of the Greek allies. He was left with Macedonians and Greek mercenaries. He went looking for Darius with them. But the pursuit of the Persian king took an unexpected turn. We have found them. After Alexander's victory, Darius not only lost his empire, but also his support. He was betrayed, ambushed, and killed by his own men. He is dead. Now you've got what you wanted. Time to return. A king needs to die at the hands of a king. His assassins question my authority also. They have to be punished. Enough, Alexander. You're the king of Persia. What else do you want? If you and your father had been braver at Galgamela, I could have killed Darius! You wouldn't have made it that far. If you don't stop, you'll end up like Darius in the dust. Are you threatening me? Alexander. Shut up or I'll forgive myself! Enough! No one questions me, neither friend nor foe. And it's not the first time Philotas is against me. Philo... This time he went too far. Philotas is hot-headed. He didn't even tell me that my soldiers are against me. And now I know why. He is the instigator of this conspiracy. But it won't help him. I will preempt him. Alexander. We're childhood friends. We have to stick together. Do you want me to wait until he kills me? He's threatened to kill me. That's treason. Punishable by death. Alexander didn't hesitate. He had his general and friend tortured and executed as a warning. Whether they were soldiers or confidants, this message got across. The Macedonian could only stay in power if he was cold and calculating. That's why he ordered a second execution. 
Then Alexander sent his death squad to Egbatana to kill his friend's father also. These were the rules of the time. Alexander knew that revenge was paramount in this case. The father would have had to take revenge for his son. And with the possibilities he had in the western part of the empire, it's easy to see what would have happened. Following Alexander's wishes, Darius was buried honorably. He was entombed in the Persian royal burial ground. His murderer, however, had to be executed. When Alexander set off to today's Afghanistan, his army was over 50,000 men strong, among them many tribes from the Persian Empire. The Macedonian needed them to crush the pockets of resistance in the remote areas of his empire. But there was no end to the bloody battles. Time and again, Alexander had to deal with defeat. But then, a young princess fell into the general's hands, and he captured her. It is said that Alexander immediately fell in love with her. Her name was Roxana, Little Star. Alexander officially made her his wife. But this marriage was also about politics. It served to establish peace and a Persian-Greek dynasty. Of course, marriages between Greeks and Persians had existed before, but not among royals. It was extraordinary that Alexander didn't choose a Greek to be his wife, which he could have done and was expected to. His father married a Greek in his second marriage. He made a statement in marrying a Persian princess so that everyone could see he was the new Persian king. Alexander adopted Persian culture without hesitation. He also expected genuflection and hand kissing, even from his own people. But it wasn't delusions of grandeur. It was the calculus of a ruler. The Persians would have despised him if he had not adopted the rituals of the people he ruled. For his friends, however, they were an imposition. They were used to different behavior. Cleitus, who had saved Alexander's life before, refused this gesture of submission. Don't you want to pay respect to me? I do, but I only kneel before the gods. I am of divine descent. My deeds are greater than those of Heracles and Achilles. And even if they were, you are just human, like we all are. We fought side by side and succeeded together. And now you ask us to kneel in front of you. I am the great king. I demand the respect I am entitled to. You treat us like Persian barbarians. You forget who your friends are. I gave you more fame and wealth than you could have dreamt of. Fame! <laughs> the fame that we've all earned should be only yours now? Quiet. And your gold is not enough to buy back the respect you've lost. Quiet, quiet, quiet. I said be quiet! <laughs> oh. <sighs> A crime of passion. It happened at one of the Macedonians' infamous drinking bouts. In a dispute about rank and honor, Alexander and Cleitus went for each other's throats. They were probably drunk. I actually believe that the murder of Cleitus was an emotional act. 
They were close friends. Pliotis was one of his best friends. And I think Alexander killed Pliotis in a rage, which he later, once sobered up, deeply regretted. But the man was dead. Just a few weeks later, this seems to have been forgotten. Soon after, the emperor went on a scouting expedition. He heard about an old mountain pass, often used by merchants. Alexander planned to extend his empire to the east. The route was supposed to lead across Afghan borders. He demanded that his people would follow him to the end of the world, to a place where no Greek had ever been. The route followed the Hindu Kush at a height of 1,000 meters. Beyond lay a land that had never been conquered. Do you remember what Aristotle once told us about these mountains? No, I can't remember. He called them peaks no eagle could pass. And beyond them is the end of the world. No Greek has ever seen it. I will give the order to leave at dawn. At about midday, we should have conquered the first pass. After many bloody battles and enormous hardship, Alexander tempted fate again. After having conquered the Persian Empire, one could say that Greece had got its revenge. But it is interesting that Alexander didn't stop and return at this point. His contemporaries couldn't understand it. They thought it was pothos, a longing that drove Alexander forward. At that time, the end of the known world was believed to be in India. The exotic country was said to border the world ocean that surrounded the globe. But the Earth is larger than ancient scholars suspected. Allegedly, 135,000 volunteer soldiers dared to make the journey across the dangerous Khyber Pass to India. The Corps Army was more than twice as large as it was at the beginning of the conquest. In the spring of 326 BC, they reached the Indus Valley in today's Pakistan. The army fought heat and humidity. The fauna was exotic and full of mosquitoes. The monsoon had turned the soil into impassable marshland. But nature wasn't the only challenge. At the river Hydaspes, the Indian king Poros attacked Alexander with an equally strong army and with war elephants. It was a bloody battle, evenly balanced for long periods. But in the end, the conquerors from the west succeeded. It was the last big battle they fought. Alexander's army was at the end of its forces, and it is said that he faced the greatest loss of his life. Bucephalus, his beloved horse, died from exhaustion. His death allegedly broke Alexander's heart. But despite the setbacks, he wanted to move on. After eight years and 18,000 kilometers, however, his men were tired of war. They became mutinous and wanted to return to Greece. 
And? Have you made a decision? We've almost reached our destination. We will be able to see the end of the world. It's a heroic act that no one will ever outdo. Our names will be immortal. I understand you, Alexander. And you know I was a loyal companion. But I can only tell you that you won't convince your men to carry on. They will oppose you if you coerce them. They would rather die here, at your hands, than follow you to the end of the world. Do you remember Achilles and Patroclus? We wanted to be like them. We were like them. We even surpassed them. They died in battle. It was their fate. And they'd asked for it. And us? What awaits us? A life at royal court? Surrounded by flatterers and bootlickers? In the lap of beautiful women and on boring hunting excursions? That's what awaits us back home. Do you really want that? Alexander! You conquered a world empire from the back of your horse. But you can't rule it from the back of your horse. If you want to be at war forever, your empire will not last. So close to the fulfillment of his dream, Alexander felt let down. But eventually he gave the order to return home. After 70 days of rain, you don't want to walk any further. Alexander then had the ingenious idea of locking himself in his tent. He was sulking and went into a sit-in. But as the people wouldn't give in, he consulted the gods. The gods were consulted by the priests, and the priests knew what they wanted and said, we're really sorry, but the gods oppose. And Alexander said, if the gods oppose, I have to return. But he returned on a different route. He sailed with a fleet down the Indus to the Indian Ocean. So he reached the end of the world after all. Then he split his forces. The ships explored the sea route to Persia, and Alexander went overland with his troops. The soldiers had to cross one of the most forbidding places on Earth. The march through the Gedrosian Desert became a death march. When Alexander finally arrived in Babylon, he had lost more men than in any battle. And the setbacks didn't stop. Hephaestion, his closest friend, fell severely ill. It was probably malaria. You can't leave me alone just now. We've still got so much to do. I am Patroclus. And you are... Achilles, I have to die before you, my friend. It is written in the Iliad. But unlike the poem, Hephaestion didn't die on the battlefield. Their shared dream of fame through heroic death didn't come true. Alexander mourned his friend on an overwhelming scale. For three days, he held funeral games in Babylon, just like Achilles did for Patroclus. Just a half year later, Alexander also fell ill during the preparations for a new campaign to Arabia. Some say there was poison involved but he probably had malaria as well. The emperor was closer to death 
than life. The court worried about the future of the Empire. Roxana was pregnant with his son, but Alexander didn't name a successor. Alexander, who is supposed to rule your empire? The most powerful one of you. Alexander the Great died on June 10th, 323 BC. In Greece, a bitter fight about his succession started. The empire he founded broke apart within just a few decades. But he spread Greek culture over three continents all the way to India. And he was the first European world ruler in history. He was buried in Alexandria, in the city that carried his name. The exact location fell into oblivion. He formed the image of Alexander, the heroic conqueror. But the honorary title, The Great, was given to him only by the Romans. Others continued to tell his legend across generations and borders. What remains is the fascination with a man who changed the world.